Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 231 of Category 5 Technology TV. It's Tuesday, February the 21st, 2012. Nice to see you. Great to have you here. Welcome, everyone, to the best show on earth. Thanks, so. Enough said. Wow. <laughs> Simply put, that's high all there is to it. High that's praises, high praises. Yeah. Really? We've got a good show tonight, let me tell you. I know for my own wisdom and insight into what is coming, the news is going to rock. And this mm. is why. Europe's Herschel satellite has entered with its, uh, with likely in its last year of operation. Apple won its first ever patent dispute against Motorola. Oh. Artificial blood vessels may soon be used for transplants. And lastly, a Canadian astronaut, Chris Hadfield, will command the International Space Station. Stick around because these stories are coming up later in our show. Well, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Hill. Lots happening. There is a lot going on tonight, and tonight we're actually going to be learning how to monitor your server, whether it be your website, whether it be uh, an internet-connected server, uh, whatever it is, we're going to be able to monitor that with free software. Uh, so stick around. We're going to be looking at that. We're going to be talking a little bit about security and how to protect ourselves from uh, issues uh, online. So stick around. We're going to be talking about that a little later on in the hour. As well, we've got your viewer questions. You can email us live at category5.tv, and that uh, that gets to Hillary. So, yes. uh, And uh, join us in the chat room, category5.tv, uh, and it's category5 on Freenode uh, if you're using an IRC client. And speaking of chat room, actually, I just want to give a little shout out to Toby hey, from Toby. Wales has been watching the show for a while now but this is his first time in the chat room ah, cool. so thank you for being there because the chat room is where it's at lots of dialogue discussion fun jokes tech tips cooking tips somehow we always get talking about food oh it's, somehow you know, somehow it's a marvelous it place to be <laughs> yeah and I think it's interesting um, that somebody like Toby has been who's been watching for a long time and I know there's tons of you I mean, we look at the logs, and we know we know approximately how many people are viewing the show through our server logs, and it's amazing to me that that so many people choose not to interact because yes, it's it's you know we hope that it's entertaining for you, and we and we do uh, you know we do our best to provide you with good content, but it's so much fun to interact. If you're able to join us in the chat room during a live broadcast, so much fun, and you know maybe Toby at the end of the show, you can let us know. You know, was was this a better experience? Was it more interesting? Pop us an email, send us a viewer testimonial, Toby, uh, at the end of tonight's show, and just let us know how how it was mm, compared sure. to uh, past experience watching the show. Because it's fun to interact with the other viewers and messages flying by oh, yeah. at uh, three messages a second. <laughs> Lots going on. It's a happening place. Yeah. We have our mobile site up and running. Go to uh, mobile.cat5.tv. Can you hold that up? It's pretty heavy. It's a pretty heavy QR code. So uh, check that out. (laughs) All right. Scan that code. Pretty sweet. What else have we got? Yeah, well, uh, stick around. Uh, We are going to just, well, we've got to run a commercial. We've got a little something, something for you to check out. We've got a lot of stuff to talk to you about after this so please don't go anywhere we'll be right back your last chance to relax is on the way up the hill with liquid image canada you can capture all the action like never before without a bulky sports cam that's a high definition video camera mask from liquidimagecanada.com hands-free hd video recording of all the excitement even in low light you'll capture the memories just how you experienced them the Summit Series video camera masks in 720p or 1080p. Available now from liquidimagecanada.com. So, world, I'm always curious to know <laughs> where where are you? Where do you come from? And we also love snail mail. Putting those two ever? things together, we love your postcards. So we've been getting postcards from all around the world. It's been pretty wild um, getting to see little snapshots of your city or your town and highlighting them on the air. 
But what is even cooler than that is what is coming next. In the next few phases of Category 5, um, the website is in the works of becoming a totally new, revamped website. Mm-mm. And some of you actually are a part of the beta team and developing that and moving forward. But one cool, groovy thing that we will be doing, can I tell them, Robbie? It's really exciting. I don't know. It's, it's kind of totally, in on some secrets here. It's totally awesome. I can't keep it inside. I'm going to okay. tell you anyway. When we get your postcard, we'll be reading them, and some of them will highlight on the air. But also, what we're going to do is scan each one so we can see the messages that you have written and also the, the picture on the front. And on the website, we're going to have a map of the entire world with the a world. pinpoint, pinpointing your town or city or what have you. And when you see the little pin, what will appear but the postcard. So not only will you see the postcard like if we're holding it up on the show, because we might not be able to get to all of them, but we'll hold it up on the show. And then also it'll be on the website. So you get to see I think that's people from cool. around the world. Yeah. Awesome. And so if you're curious, how do I send a postcard, a seemingly archaic technology? Well, you can do so by addressing it to Category 5 Technology TV, P.O. Box 29009, Barrie, Ontario. And that's in Canada, in case you didn't know. L4N7W7. So send us your postcards because we're going to put them on the interwebs and highlight where you're from. I think that's going to be so neat. It's and it awesome. really it, it looks cool. I mean, I get to see this stuff in advance, right? It does. It's he, very, very he cool. He knows stuff. the sneaky, sneaky on the beta website. Well, speaking about the beta website, if you'd like to be a part of the beta team, so there are a group of viewers who are uh, already involved in this. Uh, the beta is going to be starting in about two weeks' time. So what that means is that you're going to have an advanced chance to uh, experience the new website during the <laughs> development phases. There are four phases to development on the new V3 website, uh, and we're going to be starting phase one in two weeks' time. Cool. So if you haven't already done so and you're interested in becoming a beta tester, all you have to do is email live at category5.tv with the subject line V3 beta. And uh, we will send you the information, what you need to know cool. with regards to the beta program. That sounds pretty good I'm very to me. excited about the new site. Oh, yeah, very of course. Excited. Always I mean, moving and shaking, new developments all the time. Always new, but also we've, we've really outgrown our current site as far as uh, we just get too much traffic mm. for uh, such a heavy website. So we're making something that's very fast, very streamlined, very, very cool. And right it's got on. some really nice features. So uh, you definitely want to check that out when it's released. Uh, Garby, just backing up a little bit, was wondering if he could send a package to our postal box, the address that uh, that we accept the uh, the postcards at, and the answer would be yes. Of yeah. course. Of course. Now, what's going to be in that package? Like, what are we talking about? Ice here? cream. Cookies. Cookies treats, are good. Yeah. <laughs> toys. Costumes. Treats. Yeah. Lots of fun stuff. Delicious. These are cookies from my area. <laughs> Link. Yeah. We accept pie. It might be moldy by the time it gets here, but hey, thanks for thinking of us. Chris Reich is joining us in the chat room. Nice to see you. I'm trying to keep up with the chat room, but it is it's I know, really it's flying by. Go, go, yeah. go. I can't even read it. Nice to see Dennis Sensory Kelly. Overload. Greg in Texas. Smitty Smet. Agamotto. The whole gang. Every, the whole gang's there. Tons of people there. And you can be a part of that gang if you want. Excellent. All right. Well, we uh, we do have a packed out show. We're going to jump into some viewer questions. I'll let you uh, take it away. Tonight's viewer questions are brought to you by GardenGateFarms.com for certified organic broccoli sprout and wheatgrass juice. Visit GardenGateFarms.com. Thank you. And also thanks to Garby who sends us the first email of the hey. night. Thanks, Garby. Hello, Robbie and co-host, a.k.a. Hillary. Does Robbie feel like explaining a little bit about file and folder permissions on a Linux web host? I'm installing a CMS lemon stand and it asks me for what I want the files and folders to be assigned, but I'm not sure exactly how to do it since um, when I think I give them enough permissions to do everything, it fails. Mm. Only 777 seems to work for me, but I know that this isn't safe. Could you please explain this a little bit for everyone? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so what, what he's talking about here for those who are, are, are saying, what is he talking about here? Is basically file permissions on your server, right? When you're running a, a website, um, every single file that's on that web server, every file that's, uh, and folder that are on that server have permissions set that mm-hmm. say what people are allowed to do and what people are not allowed to do. Basically, can they read the file? 
or folder? Can they write to it? And can they execute code? Okay. With PHP, it's cool because you don't have to have the execute bit set because it's uh, it's a Apache module, for example. So uh, with your scripts, uh, Garby, you could have, uh, for example, um, read and write access for the owner, but only read access for other users. So that would be 644, right? So that would be your PHP scripts, for example. Your directories, though, you definitely, you're right in thinking that 777 is really dangerous because what 777 does, I'll just kind of explain. So read is four, write is two, and execute is one, okay? So seven is four plus two plus one, okay? So if you have six, that's four plus two, so you've got read and write, but not one. So you don't have execute bit set. So if you have 777, you've got read, I should back up. Okay, so the first number, seven, is your owner. The second number is anyone who's in the owner's group. And the third number is anyone in the world. Doesn't matter who they are, what kind of permissions they have. So if you have 777 set, that means the owner can write, can read, sorry, can read, can write, and can execute. The owner's group can read, can write, and execute. And anyone else in the world can read, here's the dangerous thing, can write, and can execute. So with 777, somebody with a little know-how would be able to put files on your server, execute them, destroy your website, install malware, get viruses going on your server and distributing through your website and things like that. It could be a real mess. So for directories, you want seven for your owner, so seven, and then five, which is uh, four plus, uh, no, pardon me, uh, you'd be looking at four plus one, yeah. So you'd have read and execute on the folder and read and execute for world, so 755. On the other hand, for your scripts, like I say, 644, that's going to be 6 is read and write, right, 4 plus 2, and 4 is going to be read and read, 644, okay? Hope that makes sense. Can you have a permission of one, Chris Reich is wondering, which would be execute bit only, um, so that you could execute while not having permission to read? And, and yes, you could, but then you would have the issue of who has access to actually reading that file. So it'd be a, that'd be a tough call. I'm, I'm unsure that would be kind of a paradoxical situation, but it's possible. So the only other thing to look at and I see a lot of stuff going by in the chat room. Mm -hmm. Hillary, maybe you can let me know if there are anything that, that I need to answer. Um, but Garby, the only other thing is ownership. If you create an Apache server, that's your web server, right? Um, let's say you, you put files in that server. Okay, I'm going to bring up my terminal, and I'm, I'm going to actually do this. Okay, we've looked at this before, where, okay, on my server, I've or my computer, wherever, I've got slash var slash www. And we've put a couple things in there, but look at index. Index.php is currently owned by root and root, right? So that file was popped there by the root user, but that's probably not the best scenario because you want it to be uh, probably running as the same user as is running Apache. So you may want to do some chown as well. And I'm going to get a command for you here. It'll probably be awk or some. Yeah, well, I can use grep, yeah. So my HTTPD, which is the HTTP daemon, I'll see if Apache is running. Yeah. Okay. So what I did here, and I'll, I'll put the command in your uh, in the show notes for episode number 231, but basically that command there is going to tell me which, which user, it's going to basically grep through uh, what running processes have the name Apache 2. So you'll see Apache 2. Okay. And this is being run by www-data. So what I can do, 
because that's the running user who's running Apache, I might want to go chown www-data, www-data, so that's user and group, index.php. Now look, ownership not permitted, changing of ownership, that's because I am in var www, so on Ubuntu, I need to use sudo. If you're on uh, Debian, you'll need to use su. So now if I do ls-all, you'll see that that file is now owned by the same user who's running Apache, which is www-data. Now in some scenarios, the reason that I wanted to show you that is that in some scenarios, if you drag and drop your web files as root, you won't be able to execute them because the running user who is Apache, this is probably what's happened to you, Garvey, because you're saying that you have to set it as 7.77. So I'll bet you those files belong to root, because you drag them and drop them as root, you haven't ch owned them, so they are not able to be accessed by the www data user, for example, if that's the running user. And therefore, the only way that you can get access to those are to go seven, whatever, seven, right? Because that last bit, everyone has to be seven in your case. So I think that's probably what's happening to you. And I hope that all that makes massive amounts of sense. <laughs> all right. All right. Very good. To to kind of put take something that's a little complex and hopefully put a, a spin on it that that makes it actually make sense. A little bit more clear. Seven forty seven. Agamotto says. <laughs> All right. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, I got another question. Thanks, Garby. Yeah. Because I always do. Well, actually, I don't. Dave Maydu does. In the chat room, just asked. I'm building a media center PC, and I was wondering which distro, uh, distro is distro 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 is the best to use. I also want to browse the web, email, and play my Warzone 2100. Also, really depends on what I, I would expect. That my rule of thumb will be which capture card you're using for that media center PC. If you're going to be doing PVR type setup, um, there are so many different ones that are out there chat room i'll welcome you to to mm -hmm. make, make some suggestions, suggestions but mythbuntu of course is based on ubuntu but it's got myth at its uh you know at its kind of core it's designed to be a uh, home entertainment system again i'm always i'm a little shocked when they when they really have lousy screenshots on their websites but <laughs> essentially you know that is what it is right the Media Center PC. Now there are tons of other ones available out there. So what does the chat He's, room say? Well, Dave's just adding, saying that he has Sky Plus HD. Okay. XBMC, exceptional. Probably one of the, the more attractive ones. Uh, I see Rob Gore recommending it in the chat room as well. Um, XBMC is a Media Center uh, piece of software. Linux based. Let's see what kind of screenshots that they've got here. Hmm. And definitely is, you know, a higher end kind of system. More probably what you're looking for if you're looking for a nice sleek interface. You've got a remote control, uh, essentially. You know, that's really, really nice. That's called XBMC. Hmm. But really it's it's a matter of personal preference and taste, uh, when it comes to your media center. Also the hardware that you're using. So um, feel free because these things are all available for you for free because they're Linux based and they're open source in a lot of cases um, you're going to be able to get them for free give them a try don't be afraid to experiment um, if you need to stick a hard drive in that is just uh, you know to test with or use live CDs and see which one you really you know personally prefer hmm. so let us know what you decide on yeah but I think those are between Mythbuntu and XBMC, I think those are, are two very strong candidates for, for doing uh, a media center system based on Linux. Sounds good, good to luck. me. Yeah. Sounds really good to me. Another question also sounds really good to me. <laughs> this comes to us from Craig. Hey, Craig. Um, saying that running Ubuntu, how do you redirect a domain coming in for serving, for example? Uh, www.rdsda.com from a domain server to a web server, but have a different domain. Say www.brokedcomputer.com. Go to another okay. server on the same subnet. Uh, 
Oh, he's saying you could just email your aunt, me your answer. But no, we are going to address it right now if we can. We will try. Um, your hint about the V-Box toys for Linux was simply awe-inspiring. Mm, cool. Yes. So, Cheers. there you go. I, I'm trying to grasp what your question is here, Craig. Um, sounds to me like you might be asking about setting up DH, uh, DNS pardon me, um, at the server level. Is that what you're looking for? Um, if you're looking to redirect so that you're, you know, if someone loads your one domain, it automatically pushes them over to the new domain. You can look at HT Access, which is a feature of Apache if it's an Apache server. You drop a little HT Access file with a 301 redirect. Uh, and that will allow you to redirect that entire domain over to um, to another um, web URL, basically. So it really depends on whether you're looking for DNS setup or something like that. But HT access is what I would look at if you're just looking to redirect a, a domain to a new domain. Hmm. But not entirely sure what you're asking for there. So let let us know if you're in the chat room and, yes, and please do. if you'd like to clarify a little bit then that'd be good as far as dns goes if that's what it is then you know that you're looking at a name records and and getting that set up you probably need to read the manual on that one because <laughs> that's a big thing getting dns set up but uh your web host may be able to assist you with that as well so, okay good luck Thanks. i hope that uh i hope that you find the answer you seek <laughs> okay I have another question. All right. Actually, it's a three-tiered, multi-layered question. Wow. So we may have to break this up depending okay. on, on how it goes. This comes to us from Ron Smith saying, I'm a uh, new user to Linux and VirtualBox and would like to set up a virtual server, then okay. convert my operating systems to virtual guests. I presently use a PC with swap drives. I'm hoping not to have to rebuild the operating systems on the VirtualBox server. Question number one. Okay. Do you have to install a 64-bit version of Linux and VirtualBox to run 32 and 64-bit virtual guests? We should probably hit each question as they come, eh? Okay, yes. so we're talking about virtual machines having a host operating system and guest operating systems, plural, having multiple operating <laughs> systems running at once. If you want to be able to run a 64-bit operating system on your host as a virtual machine, you have to have 64-bit extensions on the host. So you will need to have a 64-bit OS. But don't despair because there are other advantages here. Mm -hmm. Let's say you've got a 32-bit host. You're limited to four gigabytes of RAM, essentially, unless you're using like PXE extensions or, or pardon me, uh, if you're using PAE. So um, it, it, you really, you want to have 64-bit as your host anyways. Okay. Because you're going to have the ability to stick 12 gigs of RAM in there. And that sounds like a lot to some, but if you consider, if I have uh, a Windows 7 installed with, that's using 8 gigs of RAM as a, as a guest, and I only have 12 gigs of RAM, that only leaves me 4 for my host, right? So it, it really becomes not that much when you start doing virtualization. If you're going to be doing like Windows XP with two gigs of RAM, that's okay. So, you know, with, with eight gigs of RAM, you could do one at two, two at four, mm. right? And that's about as high as you'd want to go. You don't really want to surpass the halfway mark on your actual physical RAM. So if you're going to host four of those machines with eight gigs of RAM being used, you'd want to have 16 gigs in your system, essentially. So having 64-bit as your host is critical because Otherwise, you can't put that much RAM in your system logically. So. Okay. Okay. Part two. Part two. What is the best way to convert a physical PC to a virtual guest? The best way. I love it when I get that question because that <laughs> it really is just Robbie's opinion, Paul. You know, it's, okay. it's going to be my opinion. Uh, <laughs> the best thing to do, I think, is to always, you know, if I walk into a grocery store, it's like, I'm going to I'm gonna try the no-name one as long as the, the ingredients <laughs> are okay. I'm going to try the no-name, <laughs> see if it tastes as good as the brand name before I go for the brand name because I'm going to end up saving money, right? So right. similar kind of thought. Give a try to the open source. Get Clonezilla, Okay. If that doesn't work for you, get out there and get Acronis, True Image, something along those lines, okay? But start with Clonezilla. Basically, you boot from a CD that you create off the internet. You can download it off of their website. Um, I'll just, I know it in my head. I just want to make sure Double that I check. give it to you correctly. Totally fine. Better safe than sorry. And it is clonezilla.org. 
Okay, so this is the this is the the no name. Not really. It's actually really really exceptional. It's very good. I often prefer Clonezilla to the to the commercial product, but I say that because it's free. It costs you nothing. So you know, in in, in that comparison, mm-hmm. it's the cheap alternative as far as costs out of pocket goes. So start with this one, Clonezilla. It's free. Download it and put it on a CD. You boot from that CD and you create an image of your hard drive. Create it as, you know, uh, uh, whatever kind of image you want, okay? And then you create a new virtual machine that is going to mimic fairly closely the specs of that original computer. So, uh, you know, however much RAM, whatever you need to do to it to make it, you know, as a virtual machine, be pretty similar to the original machine. Then, again, boot up into Clonezilla in your virtual machine now, okay? So you can use the ISO, you can mount it as if it was a CD, and then tell it, okay, now grab that image that we've created and put it onto my virtual computer hard drive. Clonezilla doesn't know the difference, neither does the, com- the operating system. It thinks that you're just moving it from one computer to the other. What you're actually doing is taking that cloned image of a physical computer and uncloning it or, or extracting it, setting it up on virtual hardware. There are some things that you may have to go through. Uh, with Windows, you may have to do a repair install, which will leave your files intact, but is required to fix up the registry for the new system. So you may run into a couple of little headaches like that. But essentially, that's where I would start. And then again, Acronis True Image, if the, uh, if the free software is not going to work for you. Okay. Okay. And now, moving on to part three mm-hmm. of this lovely multi-layered question. Is there another way besides VNC to access Linux guests on VirtualBox from a Windows workstation? Okay, so you're wanting to bring up the virtual machine's desktop on a separate server? I would expect so, because you're thinking VNC. But yes, Mm -hmm. absolutely. You can go about... Now, last week on episode number 230, I was talking about how to set up the ultimate VirtualBox setup, which allows you to use just a web browser console. Not ideal if you're going to be doing uh, more than just server administration. Probably you want something a little more native. So you can actually... Because... Here's the thing is you, you're creating a virtual machine where, again, the operating system really doesn't know any different. It thinks that it's running on a computer. Mm. So with that, you know, if you've got Windows 7 installed in a virtual machine or Windows XP installed in a virtual machine, it is in every essence Windows XP or Windows 7 running on a computer. So set your network card on that computer to be bridged Okay, so set that to bridged mode on that virtual machine, and that's going to allow your other computers on the network to communicate with that as if it was a real computer on your network. Then run remote desktop. Tell Windows XP or Windows 7 that uh, you allow um, administrators to connect in and, and use remote desktop. And then what will happen is you just remote desktop or our desktop from Linux uh, over to that computer, and it's just like sitting in front of the computer. It pipes the audio over, so... Uh, I could be at a computer in another room. I could be at a computer halfway across the world and remote desktop into it and boom, hmm. good to go. So yes, um, you can you can use remote desktop. You can use uh, VRDP as a feature of VirtualBox if you want to get a little more advanced. VRDP is a little bit cooler for a, a server environment because it's it's the virtual remote desktop. Okay, remote desktop in Windows requires that you first boot your computer so Windows comes up and it's running, then you can remote desktop into it. With VRDP, you can actually um, see the, the computer's post screen, for example. So it's, uh, it's actually at the, uh, at the host level as opposed to at the guest level. So you'll be able to go into the virtual BIOS and things like that. Um, so it's a little bit different. But. All right. Cool. Thank you so much for all your questions. Uh, and everybody, uh, well, I suppose you can let them know how to get their questions in. Um, yes, of but course. But we love getting your questions. Thank we you do. So much. And one way is through the chat room. So sometimes as things are happening through the show, people have questions and we're just pulling like little tidbits and answering them on the spot. And also, we can answer your questions via email. So if you want to shoot us an email, the address is simple, live at category5.tv easy stuff and then you can go into maybe more detail in your email about um, your question and provide us with all that info in one section rather than just a maybe a quick one liner in the chat room depending on what you need so anyways mm-hmm. email do it live at category5.tv <laughs> we'll answer your questions 
It's pretty simple stuff. That's a good call to action right there. <laughs> Email. Do it. I don't know what, what else what else I can say. It's just pretty simple stuff. Pretty much. I, I think Category 5 is an interesting platform because <laughs> it gives you a chance to get your questions and interact with, with us live. But if you can't be here live. Sending us an email is a great way to still be involved in the show, get some answers, and it's free of charge. So uh, definitely would uh, welcome you to send in your questions. Certainly. And while we have had marvelous old time answering questions, I think it's time to get down to the news. (laughs) Yeah. So here we go. Here are the top stories from the Category 5.TV newsroom. Herschel, Europe's billion euro space observatory, has entered what is likely to be its last year of operation. The telescope studies the formation of stars and has taken some remarkable pictures since its launch in May 2009. But its detectors require a constant supply of superfluid helium to keep working, and the store of this coolant has now dropped to less than 100 kilograms. Herschel was launched in May 2009 and sent to an observing position 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. Its goal has been to study the processes at play in the formation of stars and the evolution of galaxies. Its detectors pick up the light coming from frigid clouds of gas and dust that are being warmed by the brilliant newborn stars buried within them. This past week saw Herschel... um, begin what engineers believe to be the final 365 days of its mission life. So sad. So sad. (laughs) Apple has won... That is pretty incredible. Um, Apple has won a patent dispute against Motorola Mobility regarding slide to unlock feature on the smartphones. The judgment marks Apple's first patent victory over Motorola in any part of that world. Motorola says it planned to appeal and the judgment would have no impact on the supply or future sales of Motorola devices. That's unreal. (laughs) Artificial blood vessels made on a 3D printer may soon be used for transplant of um, lab-created organs. (laughs) Wow. Until now, the stumbling block in tissue engineering has been supplying artificial tissue with the nutrients that have to arrive via capillary vessels. A team at the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany has solved that problem by using 3D printing and a technique called multi-photon polymerization. Wow. The findings will be shown at the Biotechnica Fair in Germany this October. And lastly, astronaut Chris Hadfield already has a number of firsts to his name. He was the first Canadian to undertake a spacewalk, and he was the first and only Canadian to board the Russian Mir space station. He was also the first Canadian to operate Canada's major contribution to the space shuttle, its robotic arm called the Canada Arm. Now, he is about to become the first Canadian to command the International Space Station, or the ISS. I'm being asked to command the world's spaceship. It's a big responsibility, Hadfield said. His big moment will begin when he launches to the station on a Soyuz rocket at the end of this year. For three months, the 52-year-old will serve as a flight engineer on the Expedition 34 crew. Then, in March 2013, he will assume command of Expedition 35 for three months before returning to Earth in his Soyuz capsule. It will be Chris Hadsfield's third trip into orbit. His first was a little more than 16 years ago when he flew on space shuttle Atlantis to the Mir space station. You can get these full stories online at category5.tv slash newsroom. The category5.tv newsroom is researched by Rory W. Nash with contributions from our stellar community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of honor or mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. From the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Hillary, I get to look at these pictures for a couple of moments as you're speaking. <laughs> it's just kind of up in front of me, and those on Backstage Pass can, can see that. <laughs> But that just kind of stood out to me. (laughs) The guy's from Canada, and he's got his mittens. Chris Hadfield, definitely an awesome thing to be. uh, What a privilege for him to be Mm -hmm. able to to actually run the space station for for a time. That is an honor, for sure. So cool. Uh, The founder of Ubuntu, Mark Shuttleworth, spent some time there as well. One of the, well, actually the first Mm. um, self-paid 
space tourist. Really? That's yeah. cool. So, very interesting fact for you. But uh, he, he's actually, uh, well, Sarnia is, is where Chris is from. Okay. So, not yeah. very far from where we're located here. I guess a couple hours drive, mm. uh, kind of south, southwest, I think. So, if I'm not mistaken. So, very, very cool. Tonight, uh, the news is brought to you by Cordery Electric, the official electrical company of Category 5 Technology TV. Please uh, pop them an email. Contact them if you need any electrical work done within about 100 kilometers of Barrie, Ontario. Our Cordery at CorderyElectric.com and the rest of their contact information is up on your screen as well. Thank you to them for uh, all the work that they've done here at the studio mm-hmm. as well. Things have been running uh, a lot smoother as far as our, our yes. power goes since they've been in. So we yes. definitely appreciate Cordery Electric. Most certainly. We don't like those glitches. When I see the lights... Tinkering hasn't in my happened. Periphery. Hasn't happened. We're we're smooth sailing yeah. now. We are. I was saying uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think Eric was on the show, and <laughs> and it would be really interesting to get the guys from Quarter Electric in on the show just to kind of explain some of the things yeah. that uh, that they encounter. Because <laughs> power is one of those things that we don't we don't necessarily think about when we think about our computers, but when it really boils down to it, power and having clean power is is something that's just absolutely key. Um, to your systems. And what shocked me about the problems that we were having here at the studio is that UPSs weren't enough to protect us. And uh, that's kind of a unique scenario. But we'll definitely uh, we'll definitely want to talk to them so that you can understand what it is that was happening here. Yeah. It's very interesting stuff. For sure. Speaking of potentially having problems, <laughs> if you run a website or you have uh, a, a web server somewhere in the world, uh, whether you're hosting websites, what, whatever it is that you're doing. I mean, a lot of us are, are interested, you know, maybe we've got a blog running mm-hmm. or, or something along those lines. Maybe I've got an FTP server running. Uh, maybe I just want to know, you know, is my email server reliable? Do I need to switch who my provider is? So there, there are a variety of different times that it seems appropriate to, to monitor a server. Um, the, certainly, there's the scenario of you know the IT guy who you know is is possibly running a small IT firm and wants to be able to monitor his client servers. You know these are actual you know say uh, um, like actual domain controllers, things like that, right? That are web accessible. Maybe find out if their client's uh, internet is up or down, things like that. So so it's important to have some form of monitoring service mm-hmm. running. There are amazing open source tools like Nagios or Nagios, depending on how you want to say it, uh, that is freely available for you to download and build a server and install it, but it's complicated. (laughs) It can be complicated to create scripts for that kind of monitoring system. It's fantastic, but it's complicated. So tonight I'd like to actually go through the setup of a a tool that is just going to be absolutely easy breezy for us to get up and running on our our systems. Yeah. So in the chat room, let us know, do you administer a server? Do you have a website where you'd really love to know, you know, how reliable is my service? Do, do I have any downtime? How much downtime do I have? Is that something that, uh, that would be of a benefit to you? And that's what we're going to learn tonight. So I'm going to bring up this website. Alrighty. First of all, I'm going to actually log into my own email here so that we can receive email when we sign up for this, because we're going to do this in real time. So okay. you're going to see how easy it is to, to actually get this set up. Good idea. Very good idea. OK. I'm going to go to a website, and feel free to follow along. It's called uptimerobot.com. This service is fantastic. It is free, OK? It allows us, pardon me, it allows us to monitor HTTP, HTTPS. Uh, it allows us to ping our servers. It allows us to uh, to scan ports. Not a port scan, but actually just see that the ports are, are up and running. So good for IMAP or uh, SMTP, POP3, things like that. So email, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, FTP is on port 21. So if you want to know if your FTP server is up, you can check if port 21 is responding. Um, also, it allows us to check for keywords. So with a little bit of PHP know-how or any... <laughs> uh, we, uh, server side uh, programming language, for example, you could just put a little bit of keyword action into that website and uh, it would set off an alarm if a certain keyword is found, for example. You, uh, with, uh, for free, okay? For Up, free. Uh, Uptime Robot will allow you to monitor up to 50 sites. And I'm not talking websites, I'm talking that could be your client's website, your website, your blog, your personal website, and 
Okay, we're up to four, I think, now. Wow. And sites also include your computer uh, network at home. Let's ping it from the outside world and make sure that you've got internet access. Hmm. It could be a client site. It could be, like I say, it could be, is their uh, IMAP on their exchange server, is it responding? Because, well, if it ever went down, everybody in the corporation's iPhones just stopped working, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's important as an administrator to know this kind of stuff. So back at this website, it's fantastic. It allows you to send push notifications to your iDevice or to your Mac computer. It allows you to receive email, SMS, uh, RSS feeds, or even Twitter messages uh, for those different kinds of alerts that are going to come in. So let's, all we're going to do is just click on Start Now up at the top here. I'm going to give it our, our name here. Category 5 TV, enter your email address, demo at category5.tv in this case. And I just made up a silly little password. Do I want to be informed about new features and updates? In my case, I'll leave that on. Might be good. Here we go. Okay, successfully entered, uh, successfully registered. That's all it is. Okay, I better write down that password. <laughs> write down I the use. password. Yeah. Don't want to forget. <laughs> Make sure your password is real strong. You don't want to use passwords that can be uh, brute forced or otherwise compromised. We've talked all about that, eh, Hill? <laughs> oh, yeah. There I go. I've already got an email here from them. Account activation. To start monitoring your websites, please activate your account by visiting this link. There we go. Your account is now activated. You can start using Uptime Robot. Let's sign in. Use your email address. You can tell it to remember you if uh, this is going to be, you know, on just your own personal computer. Successfully signed in, and there we go. So right off the bat, we're able to start setting up these monitor monitors uh, mm -hmm. and the alerts that uh, coincide with those monitors as well. And again, you can do up to 50. So let's get started with something that is going to be fairly practical. I'm going to go Add New up here, select Type. I'm going to go HTTP or HTTPS, so this will monitor both secure and non-secure. So friendly name, Category 5 Website. So I'm going to see if the Category 5 website is up and running, www.category5.tv. Under optional settings, you can set authentication if it requires uh, HT password, for example. Who do you want alerts to go to? Now in my case, so far, I only have my email address set up, but I'm, I'm going to set it to send to that, and I'm going to add the monitor to that. Instantly, it's going to start monitoring my website. There it is. So status is 100% uptime. It's green at this point. Now I want to know, you know, how's my email working? So I can go to TCP ports. I can go my email, or this could be my client email because you're going to be using a, a URL, right? So in this case, it'll be, let's say, mail.category5.tv. And we're going to scan it for IMAP. Send alerts to demo at category5.tv and go. There we go. See how quickly we're able to set this up, eh? Mm -hmm. There, 100% uptime on my email. Keyword checking, as I was describing, you can actually tell it to look for keywords, whether they exist or do not exist. That's interesting from a web programmer standpoint. And then, of course, pinging, just to see if things are up and running. So in that case, I can go, you know, category 5 is responding. So a ping is simply going to see that that server is responding. It doesn't tell you if the, if the website's up, because Apache could be turned off, Apache could be crashed, but a ping will just mm -hmm. tell you that it is responding to the web. So that's a good way to test things like if your internet connection is up, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, And again, you can intermix all these different kinds of tests. So I can add more TCP ports, right? And you can go, you know, is my web server port 80? right up and running and this could be whatever website this could be my own personal website right so this is going to tell me if apache is responding on port 80 add my monitor okay and then well what do we do if we're using a non standard port or whatever else, or if we're using a piece of software that we want to monitor where the port isn't there, we actually have the ability to set a custom port 
to monitor. So this would be a case where, you know, we're using uh, port 1022, you know, or whatever, 1234. If you're using that port for something, you can actually scan that, you can name it, you can tell it where to find it, whether it be a URL or an IP. Now that, in conjunction with something like uh, DIN DNS to allow your dynamic um, IP address to receive a host name, is fantastic you can set it up to automatically, you know, if you tell it to go through as a URL, your DIN DNS address, you can check your home network, you can check your, your home internet services up and running. If you've got an FTP server or something running at home, you can double check that stuff. So do check it out. It's called Uptime Robot. It's available, again, free of charge and will allow you to monitor up to 50 sites, whether those be computers or whatever else they be, websites, services, anything at all. Check it out, uptimerobot.com. Cool. This is Category 5 Technology TV. I just realized we haven't actually introduced ourselves. Hi. Hello. I'm Robbie. I'm Hillary. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and we're here on Category 5. And we're here to answer your questions. We sure are. And do our, do our thing. <laughs> do our thing the free, awesome way. That's what I have Any to say comments about that. about that in the chat room at this point? We'll watch for them too. So uh, Garby's just saying, "Well, I did not have a way to monitor these things, and now I do." Now you do. Awesome. See, and as I was saying, it's it, it's just there. It works. It's fantastic. I've got <laughs> it that it goes through to my mobile device as an email, so it goes right into my inbox and it dings me because it, you know, there's a new mail. It's fantastic. So. Do you have any sites that Raven you don't? Raven Lord says, thank you, I needed that. I was going to say, do you have any, like, maybe, I don't know, a junk site, something you have that isn't really functional that you could like show delete? us that it will detect it if it's not working? You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Do I have any junk sites that I can <laughs> test with? Yeah. All right. Like anything, I don't Uptime know. robot. Yeah, well, we can create one quick enough. I'm just curious, <clears> just <throat> to see what would happen. That's just sure. me being curious. I don't know. Maybe that's silly, but... Yeah, I've got one. Um, like, or not junk, but you know what I mean? Like, sure. I was thinking old ones you had in no, a while, mean, but yeah. then maybe... We want to actually... Te so this is... Hillary wants to see that this thing really does yeah, work, right? Yeah, I do. I okay. want to be a full believer. But I guess also you could test a site that you haven't launched yet, in theory, right? Because then that wouldn't yeah. exist. Exactly. Something like but, that. But I'm just But we would curious. need something that I can knock off the web. That's the tough thing. Oh. What can we possibly knock off the web without revealing too much about V3? You know what I could do? I'll set up a monitor for... Okay, I'm going to go back here. I'm going to go into my settings. Okay, I didn't mean to make all this work. No, this is I fantastic. Was just curious. Oh, pardon me. My monitors. Okay, add new. And I'm going to go HTTP. The viewer map. Okay? We're going to knock this offline for just a moment map.cat5.tv all right send alerts add monitor okay so map.cat5.tv the website is up this is live viewer locations for people who are on our website okay. viewing the show right now hello to israel we just had somebody sign on oh. from holon israel very cool okay so that's up so my monitor should show me that the viewer map is 100 percent up now I'm going to do something kind of crazy. For those of you, <laughs> I just showed them the map, and now they're, they're, everybody's going to go to it. What? I'm going to break the website, because I have the power to do that. Break the internet. Dead. Not found. Now, I wonder what's going to happen to uptime. I don't know whether it responds to a not found, because that's a little different than then, an actual server right. offline, mm -hmm. right? Now, again, I could use like a keyword, but we'll see, we'll see if this does anything to that, and I'll put it back after. I wonder if I can just refresh, if I can force it. It does automatically change every five minutes. Oh, look. Seems off. Current status is up. New status, it seems off. We will recheck quickly. So it looks like it, it's detected it. Oh, look at that, it has. It's gone yellow. So we'll wait and see if I actually receive an email here. Well, which it, it would just push it right out, right? Yeah, yeah. And they detected that quick time. Very, very quickly. So. Hark. The 
suspense. Uptime robot. The monitor is currently down. Wow, that was like instant. Instantaneous. Just like that. Unbelievable. It worked. I'm a believer. Now you know. Now we know the rest of the story. So now if I put it back online, see what's neat is that you actually get these graphs at the end too. Oh. So you can kind of, you can get an overview for all of your downtime. I better I put see. the map back because everyone wants it now. <laughs> Everyone's like, where's the map? Where's the map? Where did it go? There, it's back. So it's going to well, report that Well, let's see if this quickly. knows it's back. I think it will. Oh, it literally just changed wow. as I it changed knew. the camera. It knew. Wild so stuff. Smart. So smart. You had a bit of an adventure. Oh, my Atlanta. Well, yeah. Technology. A very important part of my life. So. What happened? I'm just doing my thing. Mm-hmm. On the internet. Just doing Go- thing. Googling stuff. Trying to find stuff. Leave the computer going. Doing its thing. Note, it is not my computer. It is my fiance's. He loves you, right? I'm pretty sure. Okay. And I hope he will after. <laughs> just, just stay. Hold on. Just hold okay. that thought. So anyways, I left the computer. Just whatever. And then I went to the kitchen. Had some din din. Come back. The screen is just full of chaos. Those little boxes of death that like layer. And then they're like, do Fantastic. this, do that. And then you try to exit them. And then you're like exiting like 72 low squares. And it was performing a scan only it wasn't it was a nasty nasty virus now i don't even know where this virus came from like i was just googling stuff like sure recipes doing this doing that like yikes nothing crazy nothing too wild on the World Wide web and then it just went mega crazy mega funk and then died what's it the operating died. system What's the operating system? I'd rather not say because he'll get mad at me because he knows what it was and what it should have been. It was Windows. Windows 7. It was Windows. This, I believe, is the case for Linux. <laughs> Somebody says to me, well, what's, you know, what's the difference with, with Linux? I, I was visiting with a, a, a friend recently and they are fed up with the problems like this mm-hmm. on Windows 7, on any <laughs> version of Windows. I mean, it's plaguing the Windows user. And really, I mean, okay, so what What does your fiancé use his computer for? For work. So all of his so crucial invoices and What software does he use entry. for invoices, or is it web-based? Um, It's not web-based. It's like a piece of software? Yeah. Could be virtualized, if necessary. Could have been. Like QuickBooks or something like that. The, the the biggest case, I mean, the home user especially, usually, I mean, what do you, if you ask the question, what do you use your computer for? Well, I use it for the internet. I use mm-hmm. it for email, but I use Gmail or, you know, something like yeah, that. Yeah. That's a common thing that I hear. Um, and this particular friend that I was, I was visiting with is like, I, 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 I want to go to Mac because I'm just sick of <laughs> Linux, uh, of Windows. But I said, have you ever heard of Linux? No, no, I think I've heard of it, but I'm not too sure what it is. And the fact is, is it's an alternative to Microsoft's products that you can get for free. You can install it. It gives you all of mm-hmm. the you know, core, func- core functionality that you would expect from your computer. So internet, um, browsing, and email, and games for the kids, and whatever else. There's mm-hmm. lots of great games on it as well. Um, plus the virtualization features that we've looked at. So. So I think the case for Linux really becomes that I, I'm not susceptible to those kinds of things. So when I talk to someone such as yourself or your fiance, and you <laughs> say, well, I don't want to make the switch because it, it sounds like it would be a, lot of, a learning curve, or mm-hmm. I, I think there would be a little bit of problems adapting to new software, you know, Firefox versus Internet Explorer or uh, Thunderbird versus Outlook Express or Windows Mail. It's really not that big of a learning curve. But here's the thing. How how stressful is it for you that you <laughs> sat down at that computer and it was like wiped? All the files gone. It was and very stressful. I felt terrible because there goes his livelihood down the tube because I killed everything. it. But on Linux, that would not have been the case. Mm-hmm. Guaranteed that that would not have been the case. And I only say that because 
when when you think about the learning curve, when you think about okay, well, could I really transition to Linux? It's like, can you not? Because that stress and that mm-hmm. burden of, uh, and the potential loss of data and the problem and the and the ongoing expense of antivirus and trying to maintain a Windows operating system, it can be a real headache. Oh yeah. So, and no operating system is perfect, but. I look at problems like that, and I think about the novice users especially. Mm-hmm. I mean, for, for us that really kind of really know our way around computers, I can use Windows 7 just as well as I can use Linux, and I don't really have any problems. And Garby will say, oh, I use Windows, and I don't ever get any viruses. <laughs> and it's, well, because you're, you're a computer guy, and you know what, you know what savvy, to watch yeah. out for, and you know how to get rid of stuff if it happens. So, but when we think about the novice user who thinks, okay, well, I'm going to buy a Windows system or a Mac system, which one will it be? Well, I'll go with the Mac because it's not prone to the viruses and it'll be a learning curve, but whatever. But then there's Linux, which is going to, again, Mm -hmm. just like the Mac, is going to basically eliminate your your problems as far as that kind of problem goes. You can still have problems if you mess up, (laughs) but it really takes a lot more on a Linux system to to mess it up than it does on, on Windows, for example. So if you're considering the change... Think of Even me. a little. Or <laughs> if you're just frustrated with Windows, <laughs> I'd encourage you to check out Linux, and I'd love to help you uh, to do that. Just pop us an email live at category5.tv. Tell us what you're currently running and what you want to, you know, what you use your computer for, mm-hmm. what you need Linux to be able to do for you, and, and I, I promise you, we'll, we'll show you how to do it. So I, I'd love to get that email this week. Because <laughs> Robbie knows the headache that can go well, into trying it's to. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's heartbreaking. I mean, Hillary is is devastated, folks, about this this poor laptop that I we're gonna know. we're gonna do data recovery on it. We're gonna get the files, and so there's no concern there. So rest assured, we'll <laughs> we'll take care of that. <laughs> but what a frustrating thing to have to go through for for a u- like think of a user who's not at your level, who simply sat down at the computer and everything's wiped. <laughs> and it's like you as it's a computer a user it's you've gotten used to it okay if you're a windows user you've gotten used to oh well this is normal i got to i have to deal with this kind of stuff and i've got to inoculate viruses all the time you've gotten used to it it's not right it's not normal <laughs> it shouldn't be the case it's so. wrong it's just wrong it really viruses is viruses should not exist <laughs> but they, they do infuriate me but you can switch operating systems it will help It'll make a big difference. I want to show you something that came in to my inbox. Oh, no. And this is exactly the kind of thing that's going to happen to you. You're going to get these kinds of emails. This is fantastic. This is a prime example of an email from PayPal. Okay, so if you, as a novice user, were to look at that, what would you think? Hillary, what do you think of that? It's an email from PayPal, right? It looks pretty legit. Like, I would look at it, you know. Yeah. And be like, oh, you know. So we've got, okay, due to upcoming March 2012, and uh, so think about the novice user sitting at their computer. Okay, I just got this email. I'm a PayPal user. Uh, okay, recent changes in PayPal service agreement. Uh-oh, we hear a lot about that kind of stuff with Google and all that and posting their new service agreements. Uh, you need to submit additional details to your PayPal account. Starting on March 2012, all PayPal accounts will come with complete detailed information. Identity protection matters, and PayPal works day and night to help keep your identity safe. According to the changes in the service agreement, unverified accounts will be deleted from the system within 72 hours after receiving this letter. Okay, that now has me scared. That's a little bizarre. I've got money on PayPal. What? You're going to delete it? I need to do something about this. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? I'm going to get verified, obviously. That's what the email here, which is perfectly legit. It's got the secure icon, so we know it's secure. (laughs) No, it's not. Seemingly secure. Just so you know, okay? So what am I going to do? Click on Get Verified. What we're going to do, I'm going to right-click on that and go Copy Link Location, okay? Just for your peace of mind here. I'm going to bring up a text editor, and we're going to see where that link goes to. That's not PayPal, my friends. That is not. It's linking to a file called www.paypal.com.htm, all right? So it tricks you into thinking it's PayPal. So we're going to go into Accessories, Terminal, CD slash TMP, make der virus, CD virus, and I'm going to wget that file. Oh, and it has forbidden the receipt of that. 
so I can't even get it in W get at this point. Hmm. But see, there are. It's it's obvious that the, that it's trying to source you with a file that is going to yeah. contain some JavaScript headers. It's going to be virus infected. I guarantee you, it's going to do things just like Ooh. what you experienced recently. So, I gotta watch out my, for that kind of stuff. Tell my grandma not to open that email. Mm -hmm. She loves the PayPal. I have uh, just a, a precious customer to me. He's 87, 88 years old now. I, I started talking about him when he was 86 a couple years ago <laughs> on the show. Uh, so he's got to be 87, 88 years old. He's just the most darling guy. And he, he'll call me up having received emails like this. And, and he's, gotten, he's gotten hit a couple times. Mm -hmm. He got really scared recently because he clicked on something and it went all weird and stuff. But I have to remind him, you know what? We, we put you on Linux. 87, 88 years old. He's using Linux. <laughs> so you know how you, you just go. hit cancel and, it just, and that virus just went away? That's the experience of Linux. As long as you don't, you know, I'll be honest, I never gave him his root password. <laughs> okay? So, for those of you who are wondering, he doesn't have the root password. If he needs it, I can give it to him and we've got it on file. But, so, here's a guy who just is, is not susceptible to those kinds of problems. But he still gets the emails. Those are viruses. Now, these kinds of things, and you get them from, tw they look like they're from Twitter, they look like from, they're from PayPal. Mm -hmm. You can click on that link, it will look exactly like PayPal. It'll ask you to log in, and what it's actually doing is it's, it's getting you to give them your PayPal login credentials, or your Sneaky. Hotmail login credentials, your Twitter login credentials. Be very, very cautious. Never click a link from email for those kinds of things. PayPal's not going to send you that, ever. Okay? And when you type in your username and password at that website, it looks like PayPal, but it's not PayPal. They get your data, then they get your money. They change Rude. your password on your account. They change your password on your Hotmail account so you can no longer get email, and they blast all your people in your email list. It's annoying. It can be a real mess. So be careful. Well, that's just more tidbits of information from Category 5. Just a little more. And yeah. would you believe it, we're, we're, we're out of time. It's about that time, folks. Time flies. Thank you so time. much for joining us tonight. It's been great having you here. Nice to see some new faces, too. Mm -hmm. Hillary, it's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's good to yeah. be here. Good so time. have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next time. We do expect your email and your postcards. Yes. See Doo -doo. you, folks. Have a great night.